I'm wearing my wife's knickers. <laughs> Ah, Miss Cardew. You and your friend Miss Howard look ravishing tonight. Then perhaps you would like to accompany us back to Duxford Hall, where she and I would be most happy to disport ourselves gaily before you on the floor of the parlor. And would I be confined to observing these antics, or might I be permitted to participate at some opportune juncture? Participate? Oh, Mr. Gosling, I can promise that you'll see more action than the Duke of Wellington's musket. <laughs> This is Winko of Red Squadron. Jerry is closing in. Repeat, closing in fast. Yeah? We need immediate cover. Immediate cover. You know what I'm saying? Please listen. My coordinates are... Wait, I've got another call, yeah? Put you on hold, all right? All right, yeah, hi, Tyler. You all right? Yeah, I'm just up in the plane and shit. <laughs> yeah, what? You what? She never. <laughs> she never. <laughs> she never. <laughs> Really? She never. <laughs> so when we meeting? Seven? About seven? Yeah, yeah. So what? We'll meet up about seven? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just up in the plane and that. So I'll see you by seven then, yeah? All right. Laters. <laughs> Winko, Red Squadron, what were you saying? Hello? <laughs> Hello? You blanked me, man. <laughs> Day two. No sign of planes, still no fresh water. It seems my three companions have no real practical experience to speak of, as they were on board the plane to attend a marketing conference entitled Making Big Ideas Float. <laughs> However, I still entertain high hopes that we shall soon find a way off this wretched island. They are going to be looking for us, so I suggest the first thing we do is write a giant S.O.S. in the sand so it can be seen from the air. OK. Right. Uh, yeah, but is it enough? Enough? Well, S.O.S., I mean, it's, it's to the point, but... It's just what everyone says, isn't it? I'm sorry? No, I have to agree, actually. S.O.S. I mean, we've all kind of seen it before, haven't we? It's a little bit obvious for me. Well, it is the international symbol for distress. Yeah, but it's a received wisdom. So if everyone's thinking the same way, surely that means nobody's thinking for his or herself. No. Well, it's what you do. Exactly why we should do something else. When the world zigs, zag. <laughs> right, let's think laterally. A plane flies overhead. A pilot takes a look down on the beach of an apparently deserted island. He sees a message. Question. What does that message say? <laughs> Help. Maybe a bit desperate, needy. Quite off putting, actually. I really can't. No, no, Captain. Success comes in cans, not can'ts. What? I know. Why don't we try something more psychological? Like it. What are you thinking? Well, see, you're an airline pilot. What is it that's going to make you want to save us? Conscience. Please. We're missing a trick here. What do we need? Don't know. Come on. An incentive. Let's pull that goddamn pilot out of the sky with an offer he can't refuse. Christ, 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 you're right. I'm thinking 10% off everything on this island. Great, we write in coconuts to give an idea of what's on offer. It's a big idea. Or how about a simple free? <sighs> most persuasive phrase in the world. No. The second most persuasive. How about... Brilliant. Oh, my God! <laughs> People. You can buy an elephant in Harris. Excellent. You can't fold a piece of paper more than seven times. Right -o. Francis Rossi can't remember the 80s. What else? The bit between your wrist and your elbow is the same length as your foot. Nice. Moira Stewart doesn't believe in ghosts. Good. Find out if she's a vegetarian. Yes, sir. There's an offer on CD cases at PC World. I want 300 clear and jewel. There's a village in India full of hermaphrodites. Is there? You can't recycle the lids of milk bottles. Yes, yes. Did I just say clear and jewel or just clear? Cats like watching snooker, sir. Cats, sir. They like watching snooker. I'm not listening to you, Declan. <laughs> Five here has been down the tennis club again. <laughs> Umpiring, isn't it? I find it very hypnotic. Hypnotic? <laughs> is that the word? Yes, this is the back and forth of the ball across the net, the thwock of cloth-covered vulcanised rubber on taut catgut. 
Yes, he's been overseeing the women's under-21s again. <laughs> a bit like putting the fox in charge of the chicken coop, if you ask me. <laughs> I think it's the glasses, you see. Makes him look respectable, like a chemist or some such thing. Reliable, trustworthy, a pillar of the community. They've no idea. <laughs> Now, this next song proved very popular on the continent. Sounds rather good, sung in French. Our apologies, then, because in English it sounds ruddy awful. <laughs> Now, sir, since the entire hotel has been booked out by the candidates of the Miss World Contest, the England football team and the Rolling Stones, you've been upgraded to the presidential suite. The Miss World contestants have sent you this. The England team would like you to dine with them this evening, and Mr Jagger has said he will personally settle your bill to recompense you for any inconvenience. We trust you'll enjoy your stay. Ah. Your wife's knickers, sir. Uh, thank you. Oh, Prue, my darling, can I use the tongs after you? Oh, well, yes, of course, Miranda, dear. It's just, as you can probably see, I'm actually mid tongue with these two tranches of olive quiche. Oh, I'm awfully sorry, no, though I did say only after you're finished, my darling. Yes, of course you did, my dear. It's just awfully distracting when someone speaks to you when you're busy doing something. Is that Excuse the shelf you're putting them on, my dear? Well, yes, it would appear so, my love. Well, it's just we were putting the olive ones on the bottom shelf. I mean, it, it doesn't matter, of course. It's just it'll be very confusing because they're a different price. Well, I did say there wasn't any point charging different prices. It just makes a simple job all the more complicated, my sweet. Can I help you? Yeah. Have you finished with the tongs, Prue, my sweet? It's just, uh, I seem to plonk them down here almost as if you'd forgotten I'd asked for them. Oh, I'm so sorry, Miranda, my love. I seem to have become distracted by this little restaurant we seem to find ourselves in. Yes, I asked you a question. <laughs> yes, you'll get your turn. Sorry, can I help you? Yeah, I just want to pay for my food. Yes, well, I appreciate that, but there's no need to be aggressive. Who's being aggressive? <laughs> Are you being aggressive? No, no, I, I just want to eat this before it gets cold. I think you need to calm down. I just want to pay for my food. Don't threaten me. I have a right to go about my work without suffering this sort of abuse. <laughs> right, I'd like you off these premises right now, thank you very much. This is outrageous. True, it's kicking off. <laughs> It's a lion. Shall we come in? Come in. You got a minute? Ah, uh, yes, of course. Have a seat. Father Stephen, isn't it? Yeah, Steve. Steve-o. Whatever. <laughs> Tell me what it is that I can do for you. OK, here's the thing. There's this parishioner at Mass on Wednesdays whose husband's just snuffed it. Passed away. <laughs> Passed away, yeah. And, uh, anyway, she's been uh, throwing me the odd look, you know, when I'm up on the old stage. The altar. At the altar, <laughs> yeah. And, anyway, um, during the bread bit, you know, she, like... <laughs> she sort of gave me this big smile. You know. You know, I think it might be the outfit. You know, but black's a very strong colour. Very powerful. Probably looks like I'm in the Matrix. <laughs> And is it that you would like some advice on how to deal with pastoral relationships? Yes, cos I'm definitely in there. <laughs> and let me tell you, she's well doable. <laughs> it's not unusual for a priest who's recently taken on the responsibilities of shepherding his flock to find that God has laid temptation in his path. Well, he got it spot on this time. I tell you, she's my absolute perfect sort. He can read me like a book. Oh, you cheeky sod. <laughs> <laughs> well, he is all-knowing. Yeah, so I just wanted to run it past you first and get your OK, Chief. <laughs> my OK for, for what? To, you know, give her my blessing. Your blessing to...? You know, comfort her. Give her a right good comforting. <laughs> Father Stephen, when a man is ordained as a priest, he forsakes sexual relationships and consecrates himself wholly to God in eternity. The vow of celibacy is not negotiable. Do you want to check that? Because <laughs> I, I thought it was one of those laws that no one took seriously, like, you know, the speed limit or, uh, or, <laughs> or dog fighting. Engaging in sexual congress with a parishioner 
particularly a parishioner who is grieving, is not only against the priestly rules of your office, but is also extremely unethical. Even with a hottie? Even with a... yes. <laughs> oh, come on, this is, this is like a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for me. You know, I don't get the grumble just throwing itself at me. <laughs> so, when something like this happens, you've got to look at it. It's, it, it's a gift from God, right? He's looking down, he's saying, there you go, Steve, one for the road. <laughs> You're not going to be shagging much for a while. Get stuck in. <laughs> it's a treat on me. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, well, worth a try. I like you, Father. You give it straight. <laughs> You can see the clarity of the church's position. Yeah, fair dues. Well, I've got to shoot. Got to see a bloke about a car. <laughs> Take it easy. <laughs> what if I resigned, shagged her, then reapplied? <laughs> I just felt so ignored. You know, I'd start a sentence and people would... would just talk right over me. I mean, you know, I've got opinions, things to say. You know, it's just no one was listening. So I thought, right, I'll become a teacher. <laughs> Be a teacher. At least 30 kids have to listen to you. It's the law. <laughs> Iran cannot be allowed to pursue their nuclear ambitions. The threat, however distant, of a nuclear standoff in the region makes that imperative. And let me be clear. The military option remains on the table. Once again, we have been dishonored by American imperialism. General. Gentlemen, 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 please. As you know, I have an urgent appointment elsewhere, but I think I may have a solution. We amend the motion to rule out the military option entirely, but we put in its place a timetable of sanctions with the aim of bringing Tehran back on board and establishing a monitored domestic nuclear energy program. Ishallah Tehran. All those in favour of the amendment? Unanimous. Amendment carried. for this afternoon's ceremony and an advance schedule for next week. You'll see I've rescheduled your meeting with the Archbishop, but pending approval from Lambeth Palace, I thought we could put him in when we get back from Moscow. Excellent. There are hard copies in the car, but I've also emailed both of those to your Blackbridges for safekeeping. Now, we're going to put lunch back to half past two, because you've got a conference call with the Chancellor now. Shit. I'm wrong, Prime Minister. Shit, 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 shit. Problem? I left my bloody briefcase in the bunker. <laughs> okay. It's got the Joint Intelligence Committee papers in it. Oh. And the nuclear codes. <laughs> right. Where are we sitting? Uh, just between Iran and North Korea. <laughs> Do you want to go back and get it? I just think it'd be a bit embarrassing, you know, because I. It's just whoever has those codes has the authority to start a nuclear war. Just... Right, right. I think we'll just leave it. OK. <laughs> Take the next right, avoiding Britannia Avenue. I say Britannia. It's more like the United Nations. <laughs> Full of supermarkets. Don't ask me what they sell. <laughs> I've never seen vegetables like that before, and the bread's funny. <laughs> Still, at least they're always open. <laughs> at the roundabout, take the second exit. Captain, a grave situation is developing in the Delta Quadrant. A fleet of Stygian battlecruisers are massing in pursuit of the exiled king and queen. You mean? Yes. Kenneth and Beverly Hamilton. We are sworn to protect them. 
The Delta Quadrant is on the other side of the galaxy. Even so, we need you. How quickly can you make it there? Number one, ETA for the Delta Quadrant. By my calculations, Captain, and at maximum velocity, we can be there by Thursday, Friday, Saturday at the latest. Then, Saturday at the latest it must be. Godspeed and good luck, Captain. We have our orders. Adam, full thrust for the Delta Quadrant. Full thrust, Isaac. Adam, situation report. I don't know, sir. Uh, running diagnostics. Captain, if I may, many years ago I served on a Tarangan attack ship where we encountered problems which displayed similarities to this. Go on, number one. After days of drifting through hostile space without power, we discovered that the engine was flooded. With respect, sir, that's just not possible. This ship is an Annihilator class Star Destroyer. She has an automatic choke. <laughs> What the hell is wrong? Well, I've run diagnostics on the primary and secondary thrusters and a full spectrum analysis across the entire electromagnetic array. It does appear, sir, that the problem lies with... Yes? The battery. It's a bit flat. <laughs> How did this happen? Sir, I think I may have left the reading light on last night. <laughs> Ian, we require your assistance. Helen, my love, can you get the jump leads in the cupboard under the stairs? <laughs> uh, I'll back up. <laughs> having a drink with Jill and Tony. Yes, um, Tony didn't have any cider, so I offered to go and get some. What the hell's going on? Well, we were looking for Holly's purse. <clears throat> what? I can't find it anywhere. You're half naked. Um, uh, yes. <laughs> Why? Uh, Holly, I, I think you better go indoors. What? Please, Holly. What is it? Look, Rog, there's a reason we were naked in your car. Yeah? We were hot. Very hot. Well, why were you hot, Peter? Well, because the heating system in this car is quite frankly a disgrace, Rog. But the car wasn't switched on. Well, it's not switched on now, but Holly switched it on earlier. How? There's only one set of keys. Look, this is what happened. I came over here to confirm with you that our meeting with Macquarie's was tomorrow. Holly said you were having a drink or two next door with the neighbours, as you usually do, and be gone for at least an hour. She'd lost her purse in your car and wanted me to help find it. I started looking for it, but then decided it'd be easier to find it if the lights were on, but as you know, the lights won't come on without the engine being on, so I hotwired the car, started the engine, we turned the lights on, but then we noticed how hot it was getting with your frankly disgraceful heating system, so we uh, took a few clothes off. <laughs> it's really very simple. Well, it doesn't look like it's been hotwired. I put it all back. First rule of hot wiring. Tidy up afterwards. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Peter. You must think I'm quite the green-eyed monster. Now I'm even suspecting my best friend. What? <laughs> Look, I told you to stop this, Rog. For the last time, Holly is not having an affair. I just found this text message on her mobile. I want to give you a rogering in the car. <laughs> what do you think it is? Did it say who it's from? No, he doesn't leave his name. Oh, that's bad luck, Rog. Bloody bad luck. Bloody, bloody bad luck. But all I have to do is press return call. No, no, don't do that. Yes? Peter? Yes? It's Rog. Yeah. How can I help you, Rog? It's you. <laughs> you sent Holly that text. I want to give you a rogering in the car. <laughs> That's what you were doing. You were giving her a rogering in the car. No, I wasn't. You were! No, what I was saying was, I would like to give your Rog a ring in the car. <laughs> Bloody predictive text. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thank God. For a minute there, I thought we were really in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Howard, you look ravishing. Though I cannot help but conject that your exquisite gown would look even more becoming strewn on the floor of my bedchamber. And a man as exquisitely fashioned as you, Captain Jennings, would look even more becoming on, beneath, behind, and for my own benefit, several inches within me. <laughs> Mind. There's a lot of talk about global warming at the moment, isn't there? Eh, dear. 
green this, renewable that. Now they're even saying Divan going to Grand Canaria or Mallorca on cheap flights, because that's just making the whole place even hotter. You know what I think they should do? They should just go up a ladder and paint all the roofs white. Because currently, the Earth reflects about a third of the sunlight that hits it. Now, so much of our land mass is occupied by buildings. You paint all them roofs white, you'll increase the albedo, the reflected light, by nearly 2%. Now that's enough to lead to a drop in global temperature of up to one degree centigrade, almost exactly compensating for all the global warming that's taken place since the Industrial Revolution. But what do I know? <coughs> <laughs> No, I don't think so, no. Oh, Bad oh, idea. On. No, I'm rubbish at karaoke. Oh, come on, it's just a bit fun. Go on, have any fun for you? Oh, so I get up there? Seriously, I'm a terrible singer. Oh, Me oh, thinks God. Nigel doth protest too much. <laughs> exactly, exactly. No, no, I don't really. Please, believe me. No, my singing is really, really bad. No, you've just I've... been mutty. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Too bad, actually. <laughs> In 400 metres, bear right. I wouldn't go left at the next lights. It's like a bloody shantytown. They're only kids playing football, but you wouldn't want to break down. You wonder where the parents are. Take the next right, into Birch Way. Right, item nine, new army boots. Major Thwellin Brown, over to you. Thank you, sir. Well, as you're all aware, we've recently taken delivery of a new prototype of British army boot. However, there are a number of issues which have not been addressed. Uh, the leather doesn't breathe, they're lace-up, which is time-consuming, and the soles are rigid. Uh, we're discovering they're far from ideal for desert warfare. OK, so what do you suggest? Well, I'm not a designer, but the Americans and Australians in Iraq are using a boot like this, uh, made from Gore-Tex, with a synthetic sole and Velcro straps instead of laces. Interesting. Well, James, you designed the new boot. What do you have to say? Oh, fine. Do what you like. <laughs> Sorry? I'm just saying, you know, if you want to look like every other army in Iraq, fine, I'll get rid of the laces. I can tell you now, it's a lot easier to design boots with Velcro instead of laces, so fine. Well, there's no slight on you. There's really no need to be so defensive. Well, I'm not being defensive. You know, you tell me what you want and I'll do it. Obviously, I'm not a soldier. I'm just a facilitator. I'm just here to realise your vision. I can see what my job is now. Thank you very much for making it so clear to me. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just that the time you save by having Velcro instead of laces could save a life. Oh, yes, cos they're always going on about killer laces on CNN, aren't they? <laughs> Listen, sweetheart, I was given a brief for a traditional British army boot. If you're now moving the goalposts, you're saying you want all the bells and whistles, you know, Velcro, synthetic soles, Gore-Tex, fine, that's what I'll give you. Well, if you could. Oh, I will. I will. But why stop at Velcro on the boots? Why don't I put Velcro all over the uniform? You know, then they could just whip the trousers off like a stripper. Might save another life. <laughs> Look, I've timed our men running in your boot and the American boot, and in the American boot, they are 20% faster. Yeah, listen, Major Llewellyn Bowen, or whatever your name is. <laughs> tell you what, I won't tell you how to drive a tank. You don't tell me how to design a pair of boots. Now, look... Uh, gentlemen, I've... gentlemen, please. I can't stand conflict. Major, you've made some excellent points, but James is upset, so I think we'd better just uh, go with these. <clears throat> <laughs> I swear 
we'll just give that a minute to set hard. You ever thought of having any cosmetic work done? Well, uh, yes. <laughs> I mean, I don't think you really need anything major doing, you know. Just uh, maybe a bit of whitening. Remove some of that staining. I don't know. I'll give you a couple of leaflets so you can have a look through them. Just see what all the different things do. <laughs> OK, just another tick or two. There we go. Let's pop them down there. Yes, it's funny, isn't it, all this cosmetic surgery business? <laughs> I mean, it's only a few years ago. The, uh, the idea of it was all a bit... Well, you know, people thought you were a bit up yourself, didn't they? <laughs> a bit vain. Uh, but now, you know, there's the old Botox, the liposuction, you know. Everyone's at it. You know, Emma, my wife, she's had some... Uh, some work done. Oh, God. Mm. <laughs> think it you know she's got a, I mean she's got a lovely figure I know she's kept herself very trim absolutely no complaints in that department no it's just after our youngest was born she decided well you know suffice to say she's always been quite pronounced down there <laughs> it's actually quite common you know. the Japanese call it the winged butterfly <laughs> they look on it as some sort of sexual delicacy anyway so she had this work done uh, Layers of vaginoplasty, I think they call it. <laughs> I must say, the chap did an absolutely first-rate job. I mean, it looks like a little pink rose. <laughs> I mean, an unexpected side effect is uh, that the sex has become absolutely brilliant. <laughs> I mean, it's so taut down there. Uh, first time I thought I'd taken a wrong turning. <laughs> You all don't. Let's have a rinse. <laughs> Item 10. New Guantanamo Bay jumpsuits. Right. Well, the Clementine is looking a little bit tired. So I thought this season... Ta-da! 